This video does contain spoilers to the FNAF movie. Watch at your own risk. I am not responsible for your decisions. After nearly eight years in development, the Five Nights at Freddy's movie has finally hit theaters and, of course, Peacock. But knowing that it was in theaters, I took the chance to actually watch it in the theater because why would I watch it on Peacock when I can just watch it in the theater first? Like, that's the whole point of a movie theater. So being a FNAF fan and watching this movie in the theater for the first time, it just brings in the entire nostalgia from the very beginning to this very moment when you watch it in the theater. From beginning to end, you can tell that this is a FNAF movie. Well, except some of the scenes, but we'll get into that later. Um, I want to give major props to Blumhouse and the Jim Henson Creature Shop for absolutely killing it with this movie they nailed it they did everything right with the easter eggs the background the animatronics the way how they move the costumes like everything like it just works like everything is just so well made the pizzeria itself looks fantastic the inside looked incredible it looked like a real pizzeria and funny thing is i got i just got done watching matt pat's video of him revealing that he was in the movie and that uh, they actually built the entire thing inside of an abandoned Home Depot, which I thought to be pretty funny, and honestly. So let's get down to the story-wise, and this is where I'm going to get into real spoiler territory for this movie. So if you don't want to see spoilers, click off this video immediately and go watch it on Peacock right now if you guys can't afford to go through a theater. But, you know, that's just an option for you guys. You can do whatever you want. So the story follows Mike and Abby, well mainly Mike, for watching his brother get taken away and possibly killed by an unknown man that he's been trying to figure out for years and has traumatized him as an adult. And that is such an interesting story that worked well for, well, in my opinion. And Joss Hutcherson really killed the role. Like, he did a phenomenal job playing Michael. Well, like, this iteration of Michael, because we know it's not the same Michael from the games, but it's, like, a different iteration of Michael. And it works here because, you know, every single time that... Mike goes to sleep he has this dream of him reliving that moment of where his brother Garrett was taken away by supposedly William Mafton and it's such an interesting plot point and in that he becomes more obsessed and more dedicated to finding out who took Garrett rather than focusing on his sister who's supposedly more important than Garrett now Abby of course. So that's where the conflict kind of rolls in. And there are some wholesome moments with Michael and Abby because, you know, they're the they're siblings. You know, Mike is the only adult that can raise her by this point because their mother died and we don't know what happened to the father by this point. And it's kind of sad to see that, you know, Mike chose Garrett over Abby because he's been so obsessed with trying to change the past. But he forgot the most important thing to him, that being Abby. So him finally realizing that in the climax was such a nice touch. And also it just works well in the emotion that Josh Hutcherson plays is just so well done and well executed. And I, I just thought that was a nice plot point for the whole movie. I kind of wish it was kind of less focused and maybe had more of the animatronics being involved. But I felt like the animatronics were just supposed to be a side thing, but it just worked well. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Officer Vanessa and her role in this movie because I felt like it was kind of weird, but then it kind of worked in the end. Again, I'm just kind of going off of what I saw in this movie and what I remembered. So Officer Vanessa is confirmed to be William Afton's daughter. So now her name is Vanessa Afton, which, you know, it works. It kind of works. Um, so her role in the movie is kind of... Out of the blue, I guess, because we didn't really know what her role was in the trailer. So I guess it was kind of nice to see what her role really was in this movie. So Officer Vanessa was hired by her father, William Afton, to keep anyone from going too far into the story behind Freddy's. And if they got too close, she would have to kill them. Or possibly he would have to kill them himself to keep his secret from getting out of hand. And it, it is possible that maybe Vanessa suffered some trauma with her dad um, we're not really too sure how the story went uh but we do know that William Afton yes indeed killed Garrett we know that 
I, I almost said Gregory. I don't know why. And she's more terrified of what would happen if her father knew that she let Mike and Abby get out of hand and what could possibly happen to her in general, which, again, makes sense because William Afton is a psychopath and a serial killer. And <clears throat> it was kind of rushed in the end, I'll admit that, but but what it was, it, w- it was a nice little plot point for her and her character arc in the movie, so I'll give it that. And the actress who pulled it off was really good. She was a really good actor. I really liked her. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Matthew Lillard as William Afton. Because this guy is truly nuts in this movie. Like, I'm a big fan of Matthew Lillard. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. I loved him in uh, Scooby-Doo, the live action movies. And in the current uh, Scooby-Doo shows and movies where he voices Shaggy in those series now. Uh, I'm also, I also enjoyed him as Stu in, uh, Scream, in the first one, actually. And seeing him play William Afton in this, it felt too last minute. And that's kind of my only complaint about William Afton in this movie, which makes sense if it wasn't given away too soon. That's kind of my only complaint about William Afton is because we knew that Matthew Lillard as William Afton was involved in this movie. But I felt like they kind of gave it away. Like, way, way too early before the movie came out. And that's kind of sad. It's kind of sad to say because I really enjoyed his role, even though it was kind of last minute. But I felt like William Afton was kind of underused. I felt like if we saw more of Steve Raglan himself, maybe we could see more of that character built up to that serial killer vibe that William Afton has. Maybe it could have been executed more better in this movie. But for what it was, William Afton is so cool in this movie. I swear. I'm not even kidding. Like, William Afton is so cool, but also kind of creepy in a really cool way. And his entrance in the spring trap suit or spring bonnie suit, I should say, was so well done. And it bring in the vibe of how dangerous William Afton really can be when he's in the suit And fully controlling these animatronics as a whole. And I felt like Matthew Lillard really pulled off a great performance in the suit. And also as Willie Mouthen without the mask. Because it works. It works really well. And it really reminds fans of the Scream movie. Of the original. That yeah. Matthew Lillard still has the serial killer vibe in him. He really does. And it just works. It really does work. And... For a PG-13 movie, they really pulled off the spring lock scene. They really, they really did it. They really, really did it. And I'm going to get into more of the kills also because most of them, oh my god, they just pulled it off so well. But yeah, that's William Afton. Okay, so let's talk about the kills for the movie. Unfortunately, it's not really gory because it's a PG-13 movie and sometimes the kills can be controversial, I should say, because again... PG-13 movie, half of the fans are kids and minors, so they got to lower it down a bit. But for what this movie was, this movie has some surprisingly good kills, especially some that are kind of cut off, but it just works. I like it. So I want to talk about this one kill in particular. It was Max's death in the movie. Holy crap, they took the bite of 87 to a whole nother level in this movie. Oh my god. (laughs) So the way how it worked was Max was lured by, I believe, the kid, the ghost kid of Freddy. And Freddy was there in the the backstage room, I should say, like the scoop. Like the backstage room, or I don't know, I don't know what to call it. And Freddy was there the entire time, standing still, until the ghost child grabbed Max, pulled in half of her body, and then Freddy chomped. Her entire half body. I was blown away by that death. Because I thought it was just going to be a simple bite to the head. But sadly Cupcake took that place. And they took the bite of 87 to the bite of 2000s. With Max being bit in half. That was such a cool kill. I That's probably my favorite kill in the entire movie. Aside from the spling lock uh, failure kill. Um... So that's pretty much it for the kills. Uh, there was that 
quite much. Some of them are off screen, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, sorry, dead meat for that. But for what some of the kills are, they're pretty good. And I say they're well directed too. They're really, they're really well directed too as well. Now let's talk about the main four, baby. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. They were incredible. I really thought that the animatronics in this movie were so alive and had a lot of personality to them, honestly. The Jim Henson Creature Shop absolutely killed it with this movie and their involvement with building the puppets and bringing them to life in this movie. So I'm going to talk about each one individually. So Freddy, uh, I say Freddy is probably the more kind of chill animatronic in this movie because he's not really that dangerous except for that bite kill but I will say that Freddy's involvement is kind of just there but it's just kind of sad because Freddy's like the main leader of the gang and I kind of expected him to have more kills out of the all the animatronics but everyone got their fair share of kills which was pretty neat except Chica Chica didn't really do anything I mean Chica kind of did most of the work Okay, so that's my only downside of Freddy is that he wasn't really, like, treated as the main leader of the gang. He was just treated as, you know, as part of the gang, not the main leader of the gang. It is confirmed that Bonnie is the most aggressive out of the four, which I didn't really see. I mean, I saw Bonnie in the closet with Hank and he killed him, like, probably smashed his head into the wall. Maybe that's what happened. If they kind of showed that. Maybe it would have convinced me that Bonnie was the most aggressive out of them. And Chica, like I said, Chica was pretty cool. The animatronic designs were neat. But Chica didn't really do anything. Aside from Lauren Abbey. But Chica really didn't do anything. She just left all the job for the cupcake to just bite everyone. But the cupcake is an absolute menace in this movie. Like He was literally the definition of a little gremlin. Just crawling around in the vents or just biting people in the head or the legs. Like, Cupcake literally did most of the work and activated that spring lock suit. He did it. Like, Cupcake is the definition of a little glamorlin, and I love it. Foxy is the definition of the most aggressive. Bonnie is not aggressive. Foxy is the most aggressive out of the four. And it shows in his scenes where he can run down the hallway. Like, when he's sprinting towards the night guard or Mike. Or even, what's that dude's name? I forgot his name. I know it's Max's brother, but I forgot his name. Uh, so yeah, Foxy is definitely the most aggressive out of the four. And it shows in his scenes too, because I feel like Foxy gets more scenes out of everyone. And it's kind of cool that they did that. But again, Freddy is supposed to be the main leader of the gang. And he's supposed to have the more scenes out of everyone and possibly the more kills out of everyone. But I'm glad that all the animatronics got their kills and they all got their scenes. But I felt like some of them was kind of underutilized, underutilized very well. And it's kind of a shame to make me say that because I love all the animatronics in this movie. Even scenes when they're not supposed to be aggressive and when they're just hanging out with Michael and Abby and Vanessa. Like, it just shows that they're just, they're, they're, they're kids. They're, they're kids in animatronic suits. Like, they're just there. Like, even in the scenes, like, where they're building the fort or they're just having fun, like, it's it, it's pure cuteness because that's what they're all about. The animatronics are meant to entertain and also they have ghost kids inside of them. So, yeah, but for what they're shown for their kills, like, it's just kind of a shame that it was underutilized. All right, now I'm going to get on to the story of this movie because I felt like the story was kind of nice. And the way how they utilize more of the lore into this movie from the games into this film, it just surprisingly worked well. I mean, it's mainly more based on FNAF 1, mainly that. But I saw a bit of Silver Eyes in there. Like, that's me being dead honest. I saw a lot more Silver Eyes in this movie rather than just FNAF 1. And because I remember the plot of Silver Eyes. It was about Charlie trying to figure out who murdered her little brother when she was younger. And this movie is about Michael trying to figure out who murdered his little brother. And who did it? Well, obviously it was William Afton. 
but the execution is there. The spring lock scene in the end of both of those stories, they both line up very well. So this movie is based on Silver Eyes in some in some way. Because I remember Silver Eyes. I remember dearly. So yeah, they're utilizing the Silver Eyes uh, novel in there, which is nice because the books are really good. Oh, excuse me. That's so rude of me. And the way how they utilized most of the lore was nice, too, even with the Easter eggs. Uh, they mentioned a lot of the Easter eggs in this movie, which was nice. I saw a lot of uh, references to the books. I saw the Sparky the dog somehow made it into the movie. I don't know how, but it, it works. As soon as I saw Sparky, my brother next to me, he was like, what are you talking about? And I didn't really explain it to him, but apparently Sparky was a hoax in the first FNAF game back when it really came out. And it's so nice that they put Sparky in there because Sparky is still a huge part of the community because he was literally the first FNAF hoax to ever happen in the franchise. Okay, so back to the story. So the story between Michael and Abby, it's nice. It's a nice little story. It's a side story. The story between the animatronics is nice, and it really works well with the uh, the main lore behind the games. But again, I saw a lot more of Silver Eyes rather than the games itself. I don't know if that's Scott trying to be a troll again, because he's the one who literally wrote the entire story. Uh, but for what it was, it, it worked. It worked well for me, in my opinion. Even some scenes with just the animatronics just being animals or just being kids. Like, it just works well. And it, it, it kind of shows that, yeah, Scott does have a sense of humor in this movie, and it works. Uh, we didn't get an F-bomb in this movie, which is kind of sad, but I'm pretty sure we'll get it in the more sequels when they work on it, obviously. But for what this movie was and its story, like it was it was decent. It was pretty good. I enjoyed it, and I was pretty intrigued through and through a bit. Okay, now it's time to talk about some of the cameos we saw in this movie, because there was only, like... Really, two cameos, and that was Matt Pat and Corey, which I thought their cameos were nice. I thought Matt Pat wasn't going to make it into the movie because, you know, he made it pretty convincing that he wasn't involved. But after watching his video, it just made so much more sense that he really is a good actor when he's given the chance to do it. Uh, so I'm going to tell you guys something. Markiplier was supposed to be in this movie. It, it was confirmed by both him and Matt Pat that. Markiplier was originally going to be the first night guard to die in the movie, which I think that would have been such a cool concept to see Markiplier get killed by the animatronics at the beginning of the movie. But I don't know. I just didn't see that well. I just didn't see that well when I imagined in my head having Markiplier be killed off in the first five minutes of the movie because I feel like he would have a bigger role in probably the next movie. I have a feeling we'll get him in the next movie. He'll probably have a bigger role by then. But... Yeah, so Matt Pat's cameo, it was nice. Corey's cameo, it was nice. Uh, seeing Daco, Ryan, Rezbowski, and I forgot the other guy's name referenced in the movie was such a nice touch, and it shows how big of the community we are and also how much Blumhouse really respects the YouTubers of FNAF. Like, they really do respect them. Like, Matt Pat literally got his own trailer, and I'm pretty sure, you know, Daco, Rezbowski, you know, 8-Bit Ryan, like, they all got their own trailers too. But they were treating it as guests. And the fact that they actually got to meet the animatronics before anyone else, that's so cool of them to do that. Blumhouse really went out of their way to have the most important figures of FNAF be at the set of the movie. Like, that's such a nice touch for them to do that. And that just really shows how much they respect. They respect this fandom and they respect the property of this movie. That's how you do a video game adaptation. It was quite unfortunate to not see Scott Cawthon in this movie as a cameo as Phone Guy because that was my biggest anticipation for this movie to have Scott be in the movie himself as Phone Guy. But my prediction could blow your mind and it could happen in the near future. So it's a possibility that this movie is going to be a trilogy. And my guess is for the third movie, Scott is going to play Henry. I have this weird feeling that Scott himself is going to be playing Henry in the final movie of the trilogy. In the final, final movie. That's my big guess. And if that does happen, 
I predicted it well. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I'll, it was very unfortunate that Scott didn't make it, and it's obvious as to why because what's been going on with him recently. And it's good to know that he's doing well as a person right now because he got to be able to make this movie with Blumhouse. And even after everything he's done, they still wanted him involved in this movie because he's the man who created everything in this franchise. And <clears throat> just having him involved and having him meet the big figures of YouTube in the FNAF community, like... It just shows that they really do respect Scott in any way, shape, or form, which kind of does sound wrong, but I don't think they see Scott as a bad guy. They see him as a man who created something really great, and that's really good of them to actually respect Scott and his franchise and his characters that he created, and it, it just... It's just a nice touch to this movie that they really do respect Scott. They really do respect him. They really do respect what he's created. And they want to get it right. Even the actors, they really do want to get it right. So that's just such a nice touch for them to do that. Overall, was this movie worth it? Yes, it was. It was really worth it. It was worth the eight-year wait. And I'm finally glad we got to see this movie for the first time ever in eight years, I guess. Uh... Is there things wrong with it? Yes, and I could see why some of the critics didn't like it. But do you have to hate on this movie? No, of course not. I mean, you can still find the positives in this movie, and I'm sure that everyone could agree on you on it. But don't go attack the critics because they said something that you didn't like. But some of the critics have good good points about them, and I'll give them that. But maybe try not to bash on the movie critics, like say something positive about it. And then just go into the critics later. Like the critiques maybe. So my overall rating of this movie. Solid 9 out of 10. I had to bump it down because the more that I was watching more reactions to this movie. I was like yeah I see their points. Like these are pretty good points of why this movie wasn't higher. Or why critics didn't like it. So solid 9 out of 10 for this movie. It's it's so good. This is how you do a video game adaptation. I'm excited to see where this goes because I'm pretty sure it'll be confirmed that there will be a sequel in the near future. We don't know how long it'll take, obviously. I just hope that they take their time with it. Not eight years time, but maybe like two of the three years time. That they'll get the second movie out by then. And we shall see how it goes. So yeah, that's my review on the Five Nights at Freddy's movie that came out yesterday on Peacock and in theaters. I recommend you guys watch it. If you guys watched this entire video and saw the spoilers, that's your fault. That's not my fault because I warned you guys about it. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with production-wise for the Fretcher Multiverse Dangerous movie and Foxy Filled the Thunder. I'm not really too sure how it's going to go, but we shall see from there. All right, guys. See ya.